Welcome to the Godspeed Institute, an enlightening and positive forum exploring all the world's religions and spiritual belief systems as an on-air classroom in an effort to help people better understand each other, promote tolerance, and foster peace. I'm your host, Care Hallandbeck. Dr. James S. Kutzinger is Professor of Theology and Religious Thought at the University of South Carolina, where he has been honored with several teaching awards, including most recently the Michael J. Mungo Distinguished Professor of the Year for 2011. A prolific writer and editor, he is a widely recognized authority on the Sophia Perennis and the Perennialist School of Comparative Religious Thought. His books include Paths to the Heart, Sufism, and the Christian East, and Not of This World, A Treasury of Christian Mysticism. He is perhaps best known for his work on the Swiss philosopher Fritjof Schuon. Dr. Kutzinger is also deeply interested in both a professional and personal way in the theology and spirituality of the Christian East, which we will also explore in this program today. James, welcome to the program, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for your interest. And now, as a beginning place, um, why don't we start uh, with the Sophia Perennis and, and what it is, and if you could explain some of this, some of the history, perhaps, um, about this uh, tradition. Yeah, so we start with uh, with a Latin phrase. I guess that's a good place to start for a, for a college professor to get <laughs> pedagogue here for a second. Yeah. <laughs> Philosophia perennis, Sophia perennis, religio perennis. You hear all of these phrases, actually. Sophia perennis, perennial wisdom. Yeah. Philosophia perennis, perennial philosophy. Religio, sometimes perennis, the perennial religion. And, of course, they all have to do, the perennial adjective has to do with something that persists over time, that repeatedly comes forth in the world, rather like a perennial flower that would blossom, Mm. you see, every year without having to be replanted, as it were. Mm. Um, Maybe the best thing to do is to look at the perennial philosophy. That's really how you hear members of this perennialist school most often denoted. That's how they most often, I think, designate themselves or perennial philosophers. Yes. Um, philosophy, obviously, you, you, your listeners know this, of course, comes from a couple of Greek words, philia, love, and sophia, wisdom. So philosophy, obviously, the love of wisdom. I think I might rather say the desire for saving truth, maybe something like that. You know, wisdom is obviously more than just, I don't know, a collection of, of notions or something. It's It's a kind of knowledge that's transcendent, it's beyond us, it's beyond the world that we live in, it, it's cosmic somehow, it has repercussions throughout the whole universe. Mm. Um, I don't know, it's transformative <laughs> when it's brought to bear upon human life. The problem a perennialist like me has, especially within the academy, is that philosophy these days is often viewed in a much, I don't know, narrower, more cerebral, more theoretical yes. way. You know, just it's, it's an articulation of a view of the world. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of people even more reductively would say, well, it's an analysis of how people use words. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Philosophers are, yes. are linguistic traffic cops. <laughs> right. They're just trying right. to make people use their words correctly. But mm-hmm. traditionally, for... Um, Well, for someone like Pythagoras, who's said to have coined the word philosophy, or for Plato or Plotinus or someone, philosophy was, uh, you know, nothing less than our openness to God, our rootedness in something like, you know, a transcendent reality, God himself. So again, when we add the word perennial and talk about perennial philosophy, we're just trying to underscore the fact, and I think it's it's a fact, it's an easily verifiable fact, but throughout the centuries, um, there has been, oh, what do I call it, a fundamental unanimity among many, many different philosophers and many, many different cultures concerning this transcendent reality, um, concerning the structure of being. If you look east, west, India, China, ancient Greece, everybody agrees Reality itself has a kind of hierarchical structure. You hear people talk about the great chain of being. And somehow, 
the human pro the human program is to ascend this chain to climb up this ladder to come into union with God and you find that again east and west ancient and modern so beneath all the uh, outward uh, discrepan- discrepancies in terminology, um, different symbols, of course, different doctors, and this underlying commonality of vision. Um, and you would see it shared by not just the Greeks that I've mentioned, but the Hindu Shankara, the Sufi Ibn Arabi, um, the Christian sage Meister Eckhart, you know, comes to mind here. And you see in all of their work this idea of a constantly manifest source of of truth saving wisdom god coming forth in the world like a perennial flower Mm. so that's 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 the idea i think here that we're working with sophia perennis perennial philosophy something transcendent and saving in nature transformative in nature thank you so much uh, james for that uh, explanation and you touched on so many things um in there uh the timelessness of this uh, eternal perhaps aspects of yeah. it, uh, un- unanimity, you mentioned, vision, right. you mentioned, Pythagoras, I love him, um, of course, and the harmonics and everything that sure. he, got in- he got into. Um, there's everything there. Yeah. There's everything there. And now, now when you call this transformative, this, this, uh, this philosophy, uh, which is much greater, of course, than a semantic argument, as, as we were saying, mm-hmm. um, what is transformative about uh, the Sophia uh, Perennis and, and how? would you say it transforms? Yeah, well, so now here we touch upon an interesting point. Um, The perennialists, again, I think like the other ancient philosophers we're speaking of here, recognize that human beings are not all the same. We have different temperaments, different personality types. We're constituted differently. We all have a different idiosyncrasy. We're wound up, as it were, in a different way. And I think most directly, the perennial philosophy appeals to and has an affinity with the person whose um, whose type is what the Hindus would call jnanic, who has um, who has a mind, or let's call it maybe better a, an intuition, maybe mm-hmm. even a gut feeling. You know, to use that kind of language, yeah. where 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 ideas take hold, where ideas themselves can have. Um, an effect on the person, not just the mind, it's not just cerebral, but there's a kind of cardiac knowledge. The, the heart itself has, a, has an aspect of knowledge to it. And these perennial mm-hmm. ideas of perennial philosophy tap into the heart of that person and can begin to change them, begin to, as I said, bring them up this, this ladder of being, um, stripping away, as it were, the the encrusted aspects that they've gotten from their culture, their habits of mind. I mean, every religion of the world agrees we're not what we should be. We're <laughs> maybe, distorted in some way. And maybe we're perhaps dist- that's, the, that's one thing they can yeah, agree on. Yeah, but they all agree on for sure. We're fallen, the Christian says. We're mm. rebellion, the Muslim says. We're ignorant, that the Hindu says. You know, they all, they all have this notion that in some way we're messed up. And that we need transformation. And again, the perennial philosophy, I think, appeals to the person whose affinity is for the ideas and who can actually, as it were, see the ideas and begin to be changed by their impact. Mm. I hope that makes sense. Oh, yes, it does. And um, I appreciate as we get into the body here, you mentioned the gut, you know, your your, your gut feeling about something, mm. the connection to, you know, this mm. is also uh, is part of the uh, in part of religious experience and spiritual experience uh, around the world that there are, you know, certain places even on the body that are connected with that truth. We'll be um, talking perhaps a bit later, I think you suggested about yes. Christianity. And of course, in the Christian tradition, the, the human being is a tripartite reality, spirit and soul and body. Yeah. Yes. A pneumatopsychosomatic unity, and all of these parts make up one harmonious whole. Mm. They all have to be addressed in any, you know, truly transformative. Again, we'll use that word. Any right. transformative program or method or science or ascesis has to address all of those levels. So there's going to be no final, lasting result. And you know, you mentioned heart knowledge, um, which emerges. We've uh, recently done 100 programs on faith around the world. Um, and have spoken, you know, with leaders and scholars of all, you know, faiths and, and religions we can encounter. And James, so many of them uh, come back to the heart mm-hmm. as the focus, whether it's, you know, the uh, uh, hearts made natural in Christianity or the beautiful image of the Sufi heart being the heart soft as wool, which is what Sufi means, I believe. 
uh, wool. <laughs> Um, and, right. you know, the, the heart sutras, it, it goes around the world that perhaps this thing that needs transforming, you know, is just a, a change of heart, as it were, yeah. or an opening up. And I think we'll get more into that later as well. You, um, mentioned, among, you mentioned among the books, I could just point this out, that you mentioned that I've edited is The Paths to the Heart, Sufism in the Christian East. And that came out of a conference I organized at my university a number of years ago. And the heart, you see, was the common denominator for both the mm. Sufi scholars and the, uh, the the Orthodox Christian scholars, they can mm. all say yes, 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 yes. This is a key to spirituality for both our traditions. Yes, and uh, and it's it's almost like a, you know, and, and even our favorite uh, films, our favorite stories out there that that is so much of that sort of timeline in the story of when you know this person sort of surrenders to the heart opening and the new life mm-hmm. that comes after that it just seems to be one of those perennial patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, we can uh, come back to. But now, can you tell us something about the development of the perennialist school uh, in terms of its origins? What did it come out of, as in, you know, in response to what? And, and who, who are some of its leading figures? Yeah, well, I think really, most often at least, people link the, uh, the perennialist school, also some, sometimes called the traditionalist school. Perhaps we should use that term, too. They're kind of used interchangeably. Um, to three figures, really, um, and I guess you could say it's really a 20th century development, early 20th century. So the first would be René Gagnon, um, Ananda Kumaraswamy, and then this man that you've mentioned that I work on mostly myself, Rithyaf Shuan. Um, each of them would be you know, noted for this kind of signature idea, distinctively perennialist idea, that all the world's major religions are united, they would say, esoterically or inwardly by this common denominator of spiritual truth or metaphysical truth. Ganon, um, René Ganon, often, I think, regarded as the founder of the school in a way, um, this extraordinary, extraordinary writer. He's especially noteworthy for his interest in defining tradition, defining orthodoxy, trying to make it clear to people that spirituality is not an individualist sort of solo affair. One must be affiliated in some way with a school or an integral organization of some kind and be under the direction of a spiritual master, a guru, a spiritual leader or father in order for the transformation to take effect the way it ought to. He also contributed to um, our understanding of traditional symbolism and cosmology and he was a devastating critic of the modern world. That comes across, especially in a couple of books of uh, Gannon's, The Crisis of the Modern World and the Reign of Quantity. Mm. Um, and we can talk about what the criticism was, if you'd yes. like. Yes. Kumar the- Swami, the this, this second figure, Kumar Swami, um, also brilliant, fluent, his son told me, in over 30 languages. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> um, had just an incisive metaphysical mind, but his real contribution, I think, to this school or this movement was a, a much keener aesthetic uh, sensibility than Ganon's to the arts and crafts of traditional cultures. He was interested in folklore, mythology, and again, arts and crafts and symbolism. And here, in his case, um, if your listeners are interested in pursuing him, I would single out maybe his book, Christian and Oriental Philosophy of Art. Mm. And a very important work. And then, the, and then this man, Shuan, um, he's really the third kind of exponent of the school. And most recently, I think people would agree he's sort of the, the premier uh, figure in the perennialist school, Frithyoff Shuan. Um, over 20 books. Um, again, the metaphysical incisiveness, cosmological breadth. But he has a kind of um, Musical quality, I guess people have said to his writing. Ganon is more mathematical, Shuan more musical. Mm. And for me, I think the key to Shuan is every sentence you read, it's very clear he's interested in um, providing his reader with an operative or initiatic sense of tradition. So whether his subject is epistemology, theory of knowledge, or art, or symbolism, or, you know, methods of prayers and the different traditions, human nature. He's always writing from the perspective of a spiritual master. He himself was a chef. He was a Sufi sheikh of a, of a Sufi tariqa for over 60 years. And he's constantly encouraging his reader in every way that he can to realize 
I'm going to use a phrase of Shiwan's here, that we're made for the absolute. The human being is made in order to be related to something that's absolute and transcendent in character, and he's constantly calling the reader to live accordingly. And I could mention just here, kind of his signature work is a book called The Transcendent Unity of Religions. You get this notion from Shuan that there is some kind of, as he says, unity of the religions in the stratosphere, what he calls the divine yes. stratosphere, yes. as distinct from the human atmosphere. Yes. Um, so he's constantly trying to guide and goad and provoke the serious reader into taking religion seriously as something that we're, that we're made for, that we're actually designed by God for. So those are the three key figures, I think, Gyanol, Shu, uh, Kumar Swami, and Shuan. Um, and, you know, where they're coming from and what they're reacting to, that's, that's maybe a whole hour's discussion. But they're, they're very concerned that the modern worldview, um, epistemological, philosophical, anthropological, in terms of our sciences, in terms of our psychologies, our social sciences, and so forth, have the effect overall, the modern world, the worldview has the effect overall of diminishing us, reducing us treating us too much as if we are simply, you know, biochemical, carbon-based mm. organisms, mm. as if our psyches can be understood simply in terms of cultural, you know, political, economic factors. And they're trying to break through all of that and provoke people to see the problems with that and then begin to move people into a direction that's, as it were, more vertical and less captivated by the horizontal. Yes, and, and that is so well said. I, I appreciate that uh, very much, and as well as um, uh, Fritjof's comment about the stratosphere. Uh, yeah. There's like a visual in there <laughs> I, can, sure. I can relate to, because, you know, in, in my work uh, for years coming out of the uh, Catholic tradition, uh, it always seemed to me that the, the saints, or the, what would be the mystical tradition, is sort of, uh, you know, rising up above on a timeline, often providing the antidote to that institutional thing happening uh, right. down here that may not necessarily be encouraging spiritual growth or offering right. peace and can be dividing people and such. And then you have the, the mystics and saints who are, I believe, connecting with what you're, uh, you're mm-hmm. speaking of, the absolute and um, uh, saving truth and the, vi- the visual symbolism expressed through art very often and similar symbols around the world. Um, as well. So this, you know, this, this is very important what you're sharing here because it seems to be emerging also increasingly in our, in our journey here as we talk to people, um, that there is, uh, there is a transcendent tradition that emerges from the religions as you're, as you're saying. Stratospheric. Yes, it's up, it's, it's just above. (laughs) But, you know, back then, let's say you mentioned the early part of the 20th century, you know, here are human beings, you know, dazzling ourselves by our scientific discoveries and how we can unlock atoms and how we can learn to do these things and perhaps starting to deify science perhaps back then. Um, and sort of reaching for this wholeness again that, you know, we, we can't, you know, quantify all the answers and just nail it all down. Um, you know, the sense of mystery or the sense of, um, you know, I, I enjoy mystery. I find comfort in it. I know a lot of folks may not. Um, and that may be a bit of the duel going on uh, in the in the century. But you let, let, let me let me just maybe be clear for the listeners too. It's not. Let, let me make sure that you you understand. Guillemot and the others are by no means you know dismissing science right. as such. Right. I mean, they're very much interested in scientia. The Latin word itself just means knowledge, and of course they're very interested in deep knowledge. It's it's when science becomes scientism. When, when people think that somehow what we see here, taste, touch, and smell, or empirical knowledge is the sum total of reality. Right. And then begin to use that base in order to exclude and negate and say nothing else really exists. That's right. the problem as they see it with science. Well, there's and a forgetting, own, you know. There's yeah. a forgetting. And, and, and I bring it up only because here we are, say, a hundred years later in the early part of the next century, and mm-hmm. and there's so much focus, especially sort of in the Western, uh, not only Western, but, uh, you know, the, the latest bit of technology, the gadget, the latest iPhone, the latest this or that, that everyone is very, very much focused on. 
and perhaps at the expense of, of what balances that. Mm-hmm. And I think we feel it in the culture. Uh, sometimes the arts come around to inspire us, and there are so many movies recently about magic, about you know fantasy, whether it's Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, that are sort of trying to address this this part we perhaps have disconnected from that sense right. of the sense of wonder, you know, about life and nature and 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 these other perennial and timeless. Um, sure. You know themes that come up. So you mentioned a, a phrase called the reign of quantity. Was it? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, C- can mm-hmm. you share about that? Because that that struck a chord. I'd like to <laughs> learn, learn more about there. <laughs> oh well, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, so what? What Gallon is really saying here? I mean, it's a big book. It's a very complex book with a complex argument. To simplify, 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 just the tip of the iceberg. Obviously, what he's saying is the quantity has been so emphasized that we're losing track of of, of quality. So numbers. Somebody said to me one time, um, the uh, the scientist says that they're interested in only what counts. And, of course, by that they, they mean things that you can actually graph or put into data tables that you right. can actually have statistics for. And everything else doesn't count, mm-hmm. i.e. it doesn't really have any deep significance to it. It's to be excluded and negated and so on. So that's really what Gannon is about in that mm-hmm. book. Mm, yes, uh, that's you know the things we can count. <laughs> it brings to mind the the little prince and the one he encounters who's counting the stars. Yeah, that's right. You know the uh, the accountant up there. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we can we can miss the point if we're if we're just we trying can miss, to count. We, we can we can miss the point. In fact, that numbers themselves are qualitative. Right. And that's a Pythagorean idea that I'm sure you're familiar with, too. Every number itself has a kind of symbolical quality to it, which is missed if you simply treat numbers as units in a, in a sequence of integers. Right. There's an overarching meaning that they can form mm-hmm. together. Of course. Um, so now on a personal note, how, how were you drawn uh, into this uh, field of study? How did you come to focus in particular as well on the writings of Shuan? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, you could go all the way back to my childhood, I suppose, in a way. I mean, I grew up on a farm in Illinois, and huh. I was out there looking but not counting the stars, for sure, when I was a little <laughs> kid. And I suppose, you know, looking back, I wouldn't have put it this way at the time, but I had a, a mystic's uh, personality type, and have had so ever since. As far as, I mean, the perennialists themselves, as far as they go, I hadn't heard about this man, Shuan, until um, actually my first year in the profession as a college professor, uh, 1980, I went to my big professional um, conference, the American Academy of Religion Annual Meeting, and I had been working, I had just finished graduate school, and I had uh, written a doctoral dissertation on the poet Coleridge, Samuel mm. Taylor Coleridge, and during my researches on his work, I was led to the work of a man named Owen Barfield, very good friend of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, part Mm -hmm. of that circle we call the Oxford Inklings. Barfield was a very great scholar of Coleridge. Well, he in turn, as maybe you know, was an anthroposophist, a disciple of this man, Rudolf Steiner. Yes. uh, 20th century, very interesting, um, esoteric thinker. So I'm at the AAR meeting, it's 1980, and I noticed in the program book a little session in which someone was going to be reading a paper on this man, Rudolf Steiner. Well, I got there, heard the paper on Steiner, but then the second paper on the program was by a man named Houston Smith, whom we all know, uh, reading a paper on a man named Frithjof Schuon. So that Mm. was my first introduction to Schuon's work. Mm. Um, And then I remember, oh, a year or so after that, being in, uh, in New York with the Weiser's Bookstore, and picked up a copy of Shuan's book, uh, recognized the name on the cover, and picked up a copy of his book called A Soterism as Principle and as Way. And I always tell people, on the way home on the plane, I started reading the book. And I read the first page, and then I read the first page, and then I read the first page, and I finally closed it. <laughs> this is not the sort of thing you read on an airplane. It immediately, I don't know how to say this really, but it just struck me as qualitatively different from anything that else that I'd read, huh. frankly, by anybody else in the 20th century. And I said, i got to give this more prayerful time hmm. later on. So I began, I guess, pretty quickly after that, corresponding with two or three, three or four people that I discovered were associated with this man, Shuan. And that, in turn, led to my meeting him personally I guess it was about 1987, 
And then I had an opportunity to go and visit with Shu Wan, speak about various philosophical and spiritual matters with him, um, oh, maybe once a year for about the next decade until his own death in 1998. So that's mm. how I was drawn to him. And as I said, it was just extraordinarily different from anything else that I'd read. And I could say, too, the man himself was um, full of, I guess, what we call presence and uh, quite different from certainly other scholars of religion. Mm. Clearly had not simply uh, learned about things, but it assimilated what he had learned about all the traditions and their spiritualities in a very deep way. Mm. And as I mentioned, he himself was... Um, a spiritual master, a sheikh in, in a Sufic tariqa, and actually people would come to him not only from a Sufic world, but from all the religions would come to him and consult with him about spiritual issues. So quite an extraordinary, extraordinary man. Mm. Well, um, thank you for, for that. You know, you bring to mind, I had a teacher in high school who told me that education comes from the word educare. Uh, which uh, translates loosely into helping people to reveal what they already know. To lead and out what's already yes, in there. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. yes. So what did Shuan, I mean, he connected, you connected so strongly with what he wrote, but, but what in the connection did he bring out that you already knew? Aha, uh-huh. now that's a very good question to ask, and I don't know that I have a very good answer. I do say to people, it was as though I was reading him by anticipation. Now, <laughs> that's going to sound rather silly and rather arrogant. I hardly am on any level like Shu on, but it was as though every sentence rang true in a way. Right. And I said to myself, "There's some. it's not just the words. There's a quality about the words. I mentioned before their music in a way that just led me to, you know, go inwardly down deep into myself, into that place of the heart that we've talked about. And I don't know that I can attach words to it, really, Carrie. It was mm. more just uh, intuitive. This is the <laughs> truth. This makes sense to me. It resonates with other things that I've seen in my life. It's putting things together. It, it you know, tied together my interest in so many different things, music and art and uh, philosophy and, frankly, numbers. We mentioned numbers a moment ago. My favorite yes. class in high school was geometry. Yeah. And somehow geometry came alive as I was reading this guy. So... Many, many things mm. um, made me think this is the real McCoy. Mm, thank you. Yes, in your gut, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, so thank you for that. That's, that's terrific. Um, now, when we talk about truth, let's say in a perennialist context, as Shuan might have, or the sa- a saving truth, as you, as you uh, mentioned earlier, h- how does one define truth or the absolute, as you mentioned before, in, in this context? Is it different from how others would consider truth? <laughs> Good question again. Um, you know, what comes to mind here, Shuan was once asked in an interview um, why his work wasn't better known among religious scholars and why people didn't read him more in university settings, assign his books in their classes. And I remember his answering by saying, the reason is I'm not a relativist. All the scholars are relativists, and I'm an absolutist. I believe in truth. And the official scholars, he said, don't believe in truth. And he didn't say it, but you could hear it with a capital T. (laughs) It was a capital A absolute. It was a capital T truth in that sentence. And, you know, again, your listeners undoubtedly know this. Most modern scholars of religion, you know, people like me with academic appointments, um, approach religion basically with the assumption that our knowledge is, in fact, limited to the domain of the senses. What we know are things that we can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can touch, we can smell. And obviously, if that were true, it would be impossible to verify what the religions are telling us about God or the angelic worlds or about our own immortality. All of that would be left off the radar. And, right, because then you know, all what you, we'd have is the is what we what you can count is things like doctrine, yeah, well, well, you'd sacraments, be left, I mean, and dogma. Basically, <laughs> you'd you'd basically. be basically left with three yeah. choices. You know, you could, you could just be a skeptic and debunk all religion as nonsense. And we got these people now. I guess right. we call them the new atheists. Right. Um, you know, Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and so forth. That would basically simply say that religion is just really ridiculous nonsense, and we need to get over this. People, you could look at religions. You know, in a, in a somewhat more positive way, you could say, well, no, the religions do encourage justice and honesty and social virtues and so forth, but you'd still not really be taking them seriously on their own terms. 
And then also, I mean, I should add this too, I guess, I find a lot of my colleagues um, in the profession are believers themselves. You know, they certainly have a faith of their own, but they've been cowed into restricting their own scholarship to empirical stuff. So historical transmission of texts, archaeological evidence from religious sites, you know, political uh, economic impact of the religions and so forth. Okay, so Shuan is just wiping all of that off the table, you see, with this comment. And he's saying, again, that we're made for the absolute. We have an innate capacity, not simply to believe in God in spite of the evidence, but to know God. It's possible for us to come to know and not merely believe in, you know, higher truths, these stratospheric truths of the spirit. But it takes a method. It takes a disciplined in its own way, scientific approach to the question of God. And as a scientist would go into his laboratory and engage in an experiment using certain measures of this and that, so also it's possible for the religious person on a spiritual path to make use of ancient, proven, experientially based methods for accessing this deeper level of knowledge. Mm. Um, so truth is well it's 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 what we're aiming toward it's the goal it's the it's the end point of the of the whole spiritual work to come into union with god who is truth one of the names of um god in islam is al haq uh and that can be defined as the truth or the real so when the sufi says or the muslim says la ilaha illallah there's no god but god he's saying there's no real but the real the only truth is the truth that there's a God. Capital R. <laughs> with a capital R, with a capital T, with a capital G, yeah. yeah. But then truth also, truth is also the means to that end. It's everything that one is applying in one's own life in terms of the virtues, in terms of the symbols with which one surrounds oneself, in terms of meditative practice and contemplative mm. effort. It's all of these things drawn from these ancient traditions that are designed to enable us in our own quote-unquote laboratory right. as we go like the scientist into our lab. Now, in our case, the lab is the heart or the soul. It's what enables us to, to act accordingly, to act in keeping with this absolute that we're made for. And, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, what you're sharing is so valuable and just brings to mind how often even those who are religious and believers uh, can get caught up in role-playing in which we become managers um, whether it's a uh, professor, as you mentioned, you know, academic uh, or in the church. I, I remember coming across uh, a beautiful po- book of poetry uh, written by um, the man who would become John Paul II. Um, and he wrote it back in the 50s. I think it might have been called Easter. And it was just the most amazing, beautiful, lovely, mystical, invitational poetry um, and then you see people, you know, sort of become encrusted, as you said, or sort of weighed down by the burden of office right. or, or the, the role playing of, how, you know, I'm a, in terms of having to manage classes and, again, quantify <laughs> your grades and your publications mm-hmm. and these things in the schools and even the pastors in the, in the churches, you know, things become about uh, fixing the roof and the collections and we sort of become managers in the religion field. Um, and so, you know, it's so refreshing to hear what you're sharing and, 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 and to remind us um, that the real purpose here is this is this journey toward this this absolute truth. Mm-hmm. And that's that's where we find our not only our greatest love, but also our deepest nature, you know, as human mm-hmm. beings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Indeed. You know, now we're about halfway through the program. It's gone pretty fast. Um, so we're just going to take a quick break, and, um, and then uh, we'll be right back. You are listening to the Godspeed Institute, a program dedicated to religious tolerance and the value of spiritually-based living. When we return from the break, we'll continue our terrific conversation on perennialists and the Christian East with author and professor James S. Kutzinger. Let's spend a couple of minutes now with an old favorite. Stay with us.
Welcome back to the Godspeed Institute. We're speaking with Dr. James Kutzinger, Professor of Theology and Religious Thought at the University of South Carolina. James, before the break, we were exploring aspects of the perennial philosophy, its founders, the ideas of of truth and of uh, emerging um, tra- sort of transcendent ideas of uh, spirituality that join uh, the world religions. Um, now, you're also very interested, both personally and professionally, in the spirituality of the of the Christian East, yeah. uh, which I'd love to hear more about. And I guess first, uh, I want to ask before, <laughs> when we speak of the Christian East, what exactly are we talking about? Yeah, well, so maybe again, just a, <laughs> a, professor, a professorial comment or two. So east, east, west, generally speaking, I guess, when Christian historians or theologians make that distinction, we're talking on the one hand in the west about both Roman Catholicism and then the various Protestant churches. And then the east, the Christian east, would be um, a reference either to what we call the Orthodox churches or the Oriental churches. So Orthodox being the Greek, the Russian, the Antiochian, the churches historically that go back to the what we call the ancient seas of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and then the Oriental churches being the Coptic, mm. the ancient church of Egypt, the Ethiopian, the Syrian, the Indian, the Armenian. So that's the part of the world that we mean by the East, the Christian East. And on a personal level, let's why don't we begin there? As far as your your interest and and you know not only in your work but uh, just in in your own life, where does where does the interest come from in in the Christian East? Well, I grew up as a as a very mainstream Protestant Christian um, in a church where, as I jokingly tell my students, uh, I was told that the doctrine was essentially Jesus was nice and you should be nice too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can't hurt. <laughs> And then the question was always, exactly how do you do that? I remember there's a story that's told about the um, the English uh, author, Thomas Carlyle, and he tells the story, or the story is told about him of his going to church, and the, uh, the preacher uh, preached a long-winded sermon, and Thomas Carlyle com- came home and complained to his mother, and he said, if I were the, one of these preachers, I would simply get up in the pulpit and I would say, good people... You know what you are supposed to do, now go and do it. <laughs> Amen. And famously, and famously, his mother said to them, I, Thomas, and would you tell them how? Oh, yes. <laughs> so that was my problem, yes. I guess, as a young man in the, in the Protestant church. And I won't, I won't give it a name right now. Right. But the church that I was in didn't give me any method, any sense of development, hmm. any understanding of how one could actually work with and work upon uh, emotions and, and distractions and how to control one's thoughts and so forth. So when I finally discovered the East, uh, through readings actually in graduate school, I began reading what we call the Eastern Church Fathers, um, people like Origen and mm-hmm. Clement of Alexandria and Maximus the Confessor and so forth, and I thought, ha, here's the how. Here's how to get from point A to point B. This is not just go to B and be good, but this is a method that I can actually you know, profit from personally. And now folks like, for example, Origen, as you mentioned, um, these were people who were part of the great, you know, the, the great split and, uh, between, uh, the churches. Um, uh, just very, you know, based on a very basic level, could you just name a few of the issues that came up that divided, um, the, the Catholic yeah, Church in, yeah. into these two, uh, distinct? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, the figures that I mentioned just now are well, well prior to the schism between East and West. We talk about usually 1054 as the decisive date in that split, and these are all early 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th century figures I'm talking about. The split was... The split was primarily political. I mean, I would have to say that I agree, at least in some sense, with um, with uh, Pope John Paul II, that the Church really should have two lungs, he said, one West and one East, and there's been a loss on both sides from that split. But it was largely over the um, the claims of the papacy to have universal jurisdiction over all of the churches. You mentioned managerial yeah, <laughs> right. earlier on. And that was the problem as far as the East was concerned. They wanted to maintain a more ancient uh, collegial ecclesiology 
where people would gather together and by consensus agree about how the church should be organized rather than having a monarchical kind of top-down arrangement. And there were other issues as well. Um, again, I don't know how much theology you want here, but the filioque issue as to whether in the creed it should be said that the spirit proceeds from the father and the son or from the father alone, this became a theological issue, kind of a technical hair-splitting issue. But the papacy was the main issue, really. First of all, I mean, there's so much to explore here in terms of the tr- these traditions um, in the East. But I wanted to ask you, how does it fit into your work on the perennialists? <laughs> well, that depends on whom you ask, Here, <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> not so well. Um, many Christians, I mean, the majority, I guess I would say, of Christians, Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox, are under the impression that um, perennialism is opposed to Christianity. Uh, and they'll often cite Jesus' words in the Gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody right. comes to the Father except by me. And they take that to mean, you know, anything else, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, whatever, is, you know, outside of salvific possibility. You can't do that. You've got to have Jesus as your personal Savior. What they're forgetting now, and this is what I try to explain to my students, is that the, um, I mean, the person who's talking, all right, who's this Jesus guy? (laughs) Hmm. The person who's talking, who says those words in the gospel, again, now, according to classic, Christian doctrine is the second person of the Trinity, the Logos, the Son of God, the Word of God, who all Christians agree exists from eternity. Now, what I like to say to the students, okay, you've just quoted a verse in John's Gospel, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father but by me. Have you ever noticed that the same person in that same Gospel says, before Abraham was, I am... That's a response when um, some of the, uh, the Pharisees are critiquing Jesus. They say, you're not even 30, 50 years old yet, and you're telling us what to do. And his response is to say, before Abraham was, I am. And you can see in the very shift in the tenses, before he was, I am, that he's referring to himself as the divine person. He's, what he's doing, he's picking up on what God says to Moses in the Old Testament, when uh, when Moses says to God, so who should I say sent me when I get back down to the people? Mm. God says, tell them I am has mm. sent you. So Jesus is saying I am. He's identifying himself with God at that point. It's clear that he cannot be confined to the historical manifestation expression that the Christian calls Jesus of Nazareth. He is Jesus. But he's not limited to that form. Right. One of the early church fathers, Athanasius, says, though he was in the body, he was not confined to that body. Right. But the perennialist, the Christian perennialist, someone like me, just says, well, of course, I believe that Christ is God. But I don't think we have any grounds for limiting his early presence to Jesus. Right. The Logos, the Christ, the Son of God, through whom you go to the Father, can very well be embodied in Buddha or Krishna, or in the Holy Quran. There can be many, many different manifestations without compromising the truth of that phrase, nobody comes to the Father except by me. Mm. But I say, I say, you know, it's sometimes not received very well. It's a very curious thing. I've got a blog, and i got a website, <laughs> and I get stuff in my email box all the time. About half of it is, you're a heretic. Oh. And the other half is from clergy, I mean, even from Orthodox, you know, bishops. I've had emails saying, somebody needs to say this. Thank God that you're actually saying this now. Yeah. So it's a very mixed bag in terms of the Christian response in my own community. Well, it's interesting, too, because, you know, the same year that you were over visiting Shuan in 87... Mm-hmm. Um, there was an event that affected me uh, very much, and I've written about it and, and talked about it as well. It was a, a supernova uh, that same oh. year. Okay. And um, for me, it affected how I perceive what you call the way, you know, Jesus is the way, mm-hmm. um, as being that he actually embodied the way of you know creation in our, our universe, the birth, mm-hmm. uh, life, death, uh, resurrection. That we find in all in all things, including the stars that died, and you know exploded and created new life, 
and it just put together for me the the cosmology that we're living in um, sure. with what these you know spiritual masters along the way are are giving in terms of messages and in the case of Jesus with his own body and his own self one of the um, early church fathers i mentioned saint maximus the confessor says and you'll like this i think he said always in everything the logos the word of god seeks to work the miracle of his incarnation mm. the cosmos itself is the incarnation of the Logos. Mm. The scriptures are an incarnation of the Logos. Jesus was an incarnation of the Logos. The heart is an incarnation of the Logos, you see. So yeah. all of these are manifestations, modalities of the same primal reality. Mm. And you saw that, I guess, with your supernova. Yeah, yes, and in fact, I call it my supernova. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, sure. yeah, that was for me. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, it's interesting because when you, when we talk about Jesus as we just did and, and we go to the Trinity, um, uh, I've been on a, uh, you know, in interviews, uh, speaking with, uh, you know, very eminent, you know, Muslim scholars like, uh, Dr. Nasser. Right. Um, and I asked just plainly, you know, what is the issue? Because we speak to so many Muslims and Sufis and Christians and we all sort of arrive around the same place here through these conversations, you know, out there, what what seems to be like the problem uh, uh, in terms of uh, these groups of people approaching each other and seeing each other clearly as as we are? And he just went straight to that point. Uh, it's the Trinity because the Muslims believe that you know God is one and cannot be three, and that this is a sticking point. And I I just wanted to kind of toss that out there in a in a you know what 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 do you think uh, about that and uh, are there any other barriers that you might identify um, yeah well this <laughs> this again is a whole show as i'm sure you can guess well um, i'd love to have you but, back <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's a complex one so it's going to depend in part i guess on how you're understanding the trinity mm-hmm. and there would be some differences go back to the the first question you ask on this side of the break between east and west the catholic would formulate things a bit differently from the orthodox but in the orthodox view it's very 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 clear that there is a kind of primacy or priority that the father the person of the father has in the godhead not that the son and the spirit are equally divine equally omniscient equally omnipotent etc they are fully divine but they come forth from the father so there is as it were a kind of hierarchy within god himself in the orthodox east now once you say that it seems to me you've opened a big, wide door to rapprochement or dialogue with the Muslim who says, there is no God but God and God's one. The Orthodox says, well, yeah, <laughs> the, the one God is God the Father, who begets the Son from whom the, the Holy Spirit proceeds, but we agree that that one person of the Father has a kind of priority. We see in the Gospel that Jesus himself says, He says the Father and I are one, but he also says the Father is greater than I. And he's not simply speaking, you know, from a human point of view when he says that. The Orthodox say whatever comes out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel is being spoken by the Eternal Logos. So when the Eternal Logos says the Father is greater than I, he's testifying to this hierarchy in the Godhead from all eternity. And at that point, I mean, I think, again, you've got the basis for some kind of dialogue. Mm. Because you're admitting, yes, sure, nothing can be equated finally with the ultimate reality, God. Mm. Now, again, the Catholics would maybe sort this out a little bit differently. You're coming from that perspective. You might have some insights about that. Um, In the Catholic West, of course, you've got someone like Eckhart, um, who's not always been (laughs) favorably looked upon, I guess, by the the Catholic West. But Eckhart would say there's a Godheit or a Godhead and the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all three, are deployments or manifestations of that. But behind those three, there is this one reality. Shuan says it's the absolutizing of the number three, as if the number three could be ultimate, that is the problem from the Muslim perspective or the Jewish perspective with the Christian doctrine of Trinity. Hmm. But once you realize that the three itself is rooted in one, whether the one God, whether the one person of the Father or the one essence of the divine, or the Godheit of Eckhart, once you realize the three comes back to one, there should be no problem again for dialogue. Uh, that's great. It also sounds like we're counting <laughs> again. 
Yeah, we're back. We're back to yeah. Uh, quantitative. If your if your if your Trinity is quantitative, you got a problem. Yes. If it's qualitative, yes. <laughs> then you've got an openness, I think, to these other traditions. All right. Three well, or four that's... years ago, as part of a conference that came out of this whole Common Word project, um, uh, the the, uh, the there's some there's some Muslims in the Middle East uh, based in Jordan that have issued this kind of approach or invitation to dialogue with the Christians on the subject of what they call the Common Word. And I gave a paper that's been published at a conference that came out of that work, and I called it Disagreeing to Agree. And I said, you know, this is a Shuonian idea, too. We need to be serious about our dogmatic or doctrinal differences. Let's not sweep them under the rug. Right. Let's make sure that we do understand Christians are Trinitarians. Christians do believe Jesus is God. That's not going to go away. And the Christian perennialist is not a Christian perennialist unless he believes all that stuff. On the Muslim side, we're not going to sweep under the rug that there's no God but God. And we're not going to sweep under the rug the fact that the Muslim thinks that Jesus is merely a prophet of God and not God incarnate. Let's make sure that we understand right, that. Right. Okay? Let's make sure that we disagree first. But then it seems to me we can move toward agreement by seeing what these doctrines point to, what they stand for what in the human atmosphere they manifest in the divine stratosphere. And that's an esoteric process, an inwardly looking process. She one talks about esoteric ecumenism. And one of my kind of deals, I guess, is that I, I warn people, not don't warn people, but I'm always hesitant to engage in what I call exoteric dialogue or exoteric ecumenism. Because that does too often mean well, I'm going to pretend that I'm not really a Trinitarian because I know it upsets the Muslims. Oh, exactly, exactly. And that's no good. That's no, no good. You have, you have to stick to your doctrinal foundation. No, ex- exactly. The point is not to wash away all of our differences and no. in- insights into this sort of bland, you know, uh, uh, concept of, of God. We all have very vital and colorful, yeah. v- beautiful insights, and we need Kumar to sort Swami. of... Kumar Swami talked about what he called religious Esperanto. <laughs> yes. You know, a made up, a made up religion with little bits and pieces of things. And that's no good. That doesn't nobody any good. Right. And as you say, pretending, you know, to, to wash something away to be sort of polite or, you know, politically correct is not, you know, keeping nope. in mind the vibrancy that the spiritual no. life, uh, you know, needs. It's, uh, we need to come to the table in all of our bright colors. Yeah. Um, but as you say, identify the things that are really essential. Right. And, and, you know, for us, and then, you know, find, hopefully find this way not, to, you know, to sort of shift the clouds out of the way so we can, you know, proceed uh, together right. on some other matters that really are common ground and not necessarily essential, right. you know, matters of faith. Um, and I suspect the uh, perennial philosophy would assist in that. The perennial philosophy would assist in that, but, you know, I, I should say again, I guess I've said this already, at least indirectly or implicitly, Shuan, Shuan would say, Better to be a fully committed, serious, pious, Muslim exclusivist or parallel Christian exclusivist than to be a (laughs) mishy-mashy, open-minded, nothing really makes any difference anyway, let's all get along with each other person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he, he favored exclusivists over just the the inclusivist, you know, tolerant crowd. Hmm. That's a very important point, I think, to make in this context, especially, you know, given the kind of things that you're doing with your radio program. He was very, very insistent about that. Oh, yes. And, you know, and this is partly why, because, you know, even <laughs> there was a kind of ecumenism I used to call alone together. <laughs> um, that happened a, a, a little while yeah. back in the in the 80s uh, and uh-huh. 90s um, that I didn't really find. There was that bridge where people were actually engaging each other, but, uh, you know, right. on, on deeper levels. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, now the point is uh, there's, well, there's just a lot of anxiety out there and there's some, po- you know, polarization that's get sure. more severe. Oh, yeah. And, and that, so when we talk about burning books and we talk about these things, and there are books we haven't even read, uh, you know, our point here, our task, one of them is to do just this, which is to find out what do people actually believe, what do these things actually mean, and get this conversation going in a you know, uh, a, a non-judgmental way that, you know, right. most most talks about religion in the media are basically a fight of who's right and who's wrong. Of and, course. you know, in our third year of these programs with the diverse people we've encountered, that has never happened. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, um, one of the things I like to share, uh, <laughs> my listeners probably hear pretty often is, uh, you know, for me, the, the word obedience uh, does not mean uh, submission necessarily or putting yourself down uh, for someone else or just doing as you're told. The, the root of the word uh, comes from the French and Latin meaning to give ear to. Right. To li- yeah. to listen, mm-hmm. and you know when we listen to each other as we do, you know we find there's a space that opens up. Sure. And for me, you know that's obedience, com- no matter what what your faith. When you're completely open, non-judgmentally toward the other person, <clears throat> you're you're assimilating them on a deeper level, but they're also you're also helping them assimilate you on a different level. Exactly. You know I mean? Exactly. Without responding, even without the words, you're um you're you're creating a dialogical space. Hmm. And uh, as we come to the end of this hour, I wanted to thank you very much for entering into this space. It's been a tremendous pleasure speaking with you, uh, James. And um, as we come to the end of the program, I just want to let listeners know that all of your website and contact information will be posted on our homepage shortly at godspeedinstitute.com. And perhaps we will have another conversation in the future um, about your your work. And uh, I hope you keep us posted on, on your projects and new articles and books that you write. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and, and God bless you and your work here. Oh, thank you very much, James. And thank you, listeners for joining us for the Godspeed Institute today.